we've had so many setbacks with like COVID or things, so things were like behind schedule or it's just been a lot of different things and I keep praying and I know you guys have been because all of a sudden a contractor can come or somebody else opens and this weekend we had an amazing crew that came and just helped as we were in a panic of we had to get things going before the carpet comes and Dan and Tom, the old Dan Action, Tom Ruther led the charge and we got that so high ceiling up. If you're not on Snapchat, you don't follow me, you should follow me because you get updates all the time. But um, it was so good and things are keep moving so we can move ahead. So just keep praying for that so people will just come and be able to work and fill in the spots that were, that were missing. But a couple announcements. We are going to have a prayer service. Um, next Sunday, but now it is going to be September 13th, just because next week is Labor Day weekend. Woo and um, so just so to make note, we'd love for people to come at 8 in the morning, and then we're just going to walk different parts of the church and pray, and just, um, yeah, just a time of prayer. Also, tonight at 6 o'clock is Bean Bay, and it's going to be, oh, and Pastor Michael has an awesome trophy, look at this. Oh, you want this, don't you, Pastor? Well, we don't want Charlie to take it. Yes. I kind of feel bad for Charlie now. I kind of want him to win. Do, <laughs> do you too, Rick? Charlie, wherever you are, I'm going to go for you and Phil now because I kind of feel bad because I keep picking on you guys. It'll be Rob and I now because Phil's hard to I can't oh. beat him, so I joined him. Oh, okay. <laughs> so now you guys can all be against Charlie, Rob, and I'll vote for you guys so you can do this. Just kidding. Anyway, so that should be fun. And then um, just also, we are going to be having youth group kickoff September 9th. We'll probably, yeah, yeah, we're not going to be in the new building, but we'll be here, and hopefully by the end of September, we'll be able to come back and be in that new building. So it's going to be great. We're going to have junior youth and youth group, which I am so excited to be back with the kids. So it's going to be an awesome time. So get that on your schedule. Well, thank you so much, Kay. And again, I want to thank everyone who's been working on the building. Uh, we had a fantastic team yesterday, but also really through the last several months, people have come in, have volunteered, who have cleaned, and uh, you all have done an amazing job, and I can't wait, wait for us to complete this uh, project and to see how God uses it. Well, uh, we do have a rose here on stage to celebrate. We have a new baby in the Reitmeyer family. Uh, Kiera was born to Teresha and Aaron last week, so if you see uh, Dave and Julie around, they're very proud grandparents. We want to celebrate with all of them. I want to invite uh, Charlie to come up here right now, one of our elders. And the reason I'm inviting him up is uh, you've all seen the news over the last week and really over the last several months of the unrest in our country. Um, you know, often we hear of riots and unrest. It feels very far from here. We had it in Minneapolis not long ago, but even in Kenosha, Wisconsin, it's not that far away. And uh, when I think about what's been going on in our country, I'm reminded of a story in the Gospels. There's one time that uh, the disciples brought this young man to Jesus who was uh, being possessed by an evil spirit. And they asked Jesus, we've been trying to cast this spirit out. Uh, why can't we do that? And Jesus says the reason why is that this spirit can only be sent out through prayer. That one of the greatest things that we can do as a church during times of unrest is be people of prayer. So I want to take a moment as we go on the worship Really, the, the prayer of our country. I've asked Charlie to come up and do that. Uh, he's going to pray for our country. And then I'm going to pray as we the service. Uh, one more thing I, I want to highlight also is when school started, uh, we want to keep our, our teachers in prayer, keep our students in prayer. So, Charlie, I'm going to ask you to pray over our country, and then I'll, uh, uh, I'll continue in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just we lift up this country, we lift up our leaders, Lord. We lift them all up to you and that they may see you, Lord, and that they may follow your direction. Lord, we ask that you cast out all evil that's going on, all the divide that's in this country, Lord, that we may, may be a nation that comes to you, that we fall on our knees and we pray to you, O oh Lord, for your guidance through all things, small and great, that we just ask for your guidance and how to deal with the divide and the separation and the division and everything that's going on, all the violence, Lord. You are the only way that we can come to peace and be one great nation again under you. Lord, I just lift up our teachers, our students, everybody that's involved in schools this year, Lord, with everything that's going on with all the COVID-19 stuff, just that 
They remember that you're in charge and that you are watching over everything that's going on. But we lift them up to have extra patience to, to deal with all of this, Lord. Lord, we just pray for all these things in your holy, holy name. And Father, we want to pray you keep us in the attitude of prayer. This would be a morning that we're able to see your heart. Lord, fill us with love and, and all the distractions we bring in with us. May those just drift away for us to clearly see you. Uh, bless this time in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to remind you that due to COVID, we're not uh, passing an offering plate, but we do have the giving center available in the back. I also have a box available over here if God has led you to give, give in any way. Um, one more thing. Uh, usually on the last Sunday of the month, we do a missions focus. We're part of the Christian Missionary Alliance, our denomination, and they're very actively involved with mission work around the world. In fact, as a church, uh, we give to the Great Commission Fund. A part of what comes in the church goes toward missions. So we want to show you this video to show how God has been using uh, the Great Commission Fund recently to uh, bring glory to his name. Take a look at the screen. It's not there. It's not there. <laughs> it was there. Okay, so if he's not the there, Alliance it's family, we're on mission together. I'm so encouraged by the way that you've engaged, even just in recent days. You may remember that at the beginning of the COVID crisis, I came to you concerned because it felt like we were gonna to have to pull back. And we did with budgets and with salaries, but we haven't had to pull back with personnel. We are caring in chaos because of you. I want you to know of some of the impact around the world that you're making because your workers have been allowed to stay in place. <coughs> Our Kama team has been able to distribute $150,000 of meals and personal protective equipment and utility assistance through 72 of our churches in 23 states and Puerto Rico. Through your engagement with Envision, 300 families have been fed over a long period of time in Miami and 2,000 urban poor in Manila are receiving help multiple times a week. In one North African country, over 250 families have been able to be fed and seven new believers have been baptized. In South Asia, nearly 100 human trafficking survivors have received emergency food rations through your access teams. In West Africa, for example, hundreds of street kids are being fed through the local church in the secular nation of Uruguay, where COVID has caused people to reevaluate what life after death might mean. Two have found salvation in Jesus. So I started by saying Alliance Family we're on mission together. I'm serious about that. And I want you to know what an honor it is to be president of an organization like this. When the human need increases, so does the responsiveness to the gospel. So the fact that we've been able to stay present, on location, being Jesus in these communities is very significant. Our calling is clear, our task is unfinished, but together we will stay on mission. Alliance family, all right, welcome everybody to Crosspoint. It's great to see your smiling faces out there, or at least your eyes smiling anyway. If you want to stand up, we'll uh, begin our worship.
Dan, if you want, you can turn all the lights on. You. 
never stop working Even when I don't see you working Even when I don't feel like you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see you working Even when I don't feel you working You never stop, you never stop working you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Waymaker, miracle worker Promise keeper, light in the darkness My God, that is who you are
for gathering us all here today. Thank you that we were all able to make it here safely. I pray that we can just take something away from this message and just take it all in. I pray that there is healing on people that just need it right now or people that are praying on others for healing. Just come to them, speak through them, speak in them. Amen. just being able to see the screen, we can turn all the lights on and still see what's up there. Well, before we get into the message, I want to share a little bit about what's going on this fall. Uh, many of you have heard me talk about this a little bit already, maybe got an email last week about this, how um, you know, one of our core values is discipleship. And one thing that we believe is discipleship happens best in the context of relationships and some kind of community. And uh, many of you have been involved in small groups in the past. Uh, we've really talked about small groups the last several years, uh, really being a setting for 8 to 12 people to be together, to interact, to ask each other questions, hold each other accountable. And we recognize that they may not function the way they have in the past this fall, that uh, for many uh, right now, being in a group in a home just does not feel safe. So we're doing something this fall that's kind of a, adapting the small group model a little bit called uh, COVID clusters. And here's basically what we're doing. If uh, you're already involved in the small group and your small group wants to keep on meeting, we want to cheer you on. Keep on going. Maybe you're here like to be a part of a small group. If that's the case, we'd love to get you into a small group. Maybe you're not comfortable with that, but maybe being with another couple or another person in a much smaller setting, maybe even... You know, meeting at Lakes Cafe with another person once a week. Maybe that would work better for you. And uh, the point is, we want to get everyone, as many people as possible, in some kind of Christ-centered relationship. Right away, maybe you have something set up. Maybe you know who you'd like to ask. Maybe you're sitting here and thinking, I don't even know where to begin. I, I don't know who to ask about getting together. And if that's the case, uh, we would like to help you. Uh, many of you have cards on your chairs. Um, if you want to fill that out and turn that in, you can put it in the giving center or put it here in that box. Um, if you fill that out and identify what kind of group you'd like, uh, we have a team that will work on connecting you with someone or connecting you with the group. Uh, another option is uh, on our church website. We have a place that you can email to, to join a group. Uh, you can do that. 
And we are doing a special series looking at the big picture of the Bible coming this fall. And we have resources, site resources going with that. Groups don't have to use that. If God lays something else in your heart, you can use that. But we are providing resources if you're looking for resources to use. And uh, as I said, I, we care about more than anything is for you to be in some kind of community. And we believe that God uses that. And we're eager to see what God is going to do. Uh, I want to invite you right now, we're going to jump into our, our Bible passage. Uh, if you want to turn to Matthew chapter 7, uh, we've been doing this series on the Sermon on the Mount. Last week, we technically ended the series, we concluded it, um, but that's because the conclusion worked better for our service at Pioneer Grounds. So we ended it last week, but we have one more week. So just pretend that this is actually last week and that last week is this week. Um, Sermon on the Mount is this message that Jesus gave about living in the kingdom of God. That if you are a follower of Jesus, what kind of person is the Holy Spirit transforming you into? And our role is to partner with the Holy Spirit. Our role is to develop habits to help us become this kind of person that uh, really uh, has the character of Christ, that has this lifestyle permeating the way that we live. Now, uh, what we're going to look at today is what Jesus teaches about judging. And I'm going to suggest that this may be one of the most uh, abused passages by some Christians and other groups of Christians. It's often one of the ones that we tend to not apply very well. And we're going to try to dig into to see what does it mean for us to live this out. And if I were to summarize kind of where we're going this morning, is that Christ's followers are, were to humbly discern good and evil knowing that God alone has the right to determine the condition of one's heart. And we'll flesh it out as we move into this morning. If you join me, we're going to start reading Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 1. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to one another, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Jesus starts off with a very clear command. He says, do not judge, or you too will be judged. Do not judge. Now, before we go any further, we need to ask the question, what does it mean to judge? Uh, literally, the definition is to render an opinion, and there's different ways that we do that. I mean, for example, uh, you know, our family, we could go out to, say, Betty's Pantry in Battle Lake, get some ice cream, and I can render a judgment that it tastes good. Uh, in a few months, we're going to have an election. I, I'm going to go into the polling place, and I'm going to render an opinion about who I think of the candidates listed is best fit to lead our country. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was at Glendalow State Park, and uh, this van pulled in, this like 1970s, 1980s van, and I saw the driver, this guy had a mullet, uh, it's like the 80s coming back, and uh, on the side of the van, there were some uh, very um, exp expletive words uh, written on the side of the van that I will not repeat here. And uh, looking at those words, looking at the mullet, I very quickly uh, made several opinions about this person. I didn't talk to him. I know nothing about his background, but I rendered a judgment about who I thought he was, about what I thought about his character. Those are all different kinds of judging. And I asked the question, okay, is Jesus saying not to do any of those? What kind of judging he's saying not to do? Well, if you look at the rest of the ministry of Jesus the, throughout the Bible, um, Jesus does tell his followers to discern, to make a judgment between good and evil. We're supposed to reject evil. We're supposed to make judgments about the decisions that are right. Uh, you have uh, in the book of Titus in 1 Timothy, you have Paul, who he's filled with the Holy Spirit. He, he's writing these things about choosing leaders for the church. And he gives them a list of qualifications for elders. He tells them, choose your leaders wisely. That kind of judging should happen. Really, I, I think the best way to put it, that what Jesus is talking about here is when we make a judgment, I'll put it up here on the screen here, making a judgment about one's heart and their standing or lack of there before God. 
And we make a judgment saying that, you know, even though I can't see the condition of your heart, I'm going to assume I know where you stand with God. I'm going to assume whether you are a good or a bad person, I'm either going to praise you or condemn you based on what I've seen. Now, I said earlier, I, I really think that this passage uh, it can be a little bit confusing. Our culture is confused about what it means to judge. Uh, many of you have heard, you know, the church has a reputation for being judgmental. I saw a poll recently done among Christian millennials from my age group, and 50% said that they believe the church was far too judgmental. And the church has definitely earned that reputation at times. There are times when the church can be very condemning. But also I think there's a lot of times where it's not earned, where I think that the wrong definition is applied to the word judging. And let me explain this. There's a difference between condemning a person and judging whether an action is right or wrong. We live in a culture in which, at least right now, the greatest value our culture has is that of happiness. That everyone should be pursuing their own happiness in whatever way they want to, and it's assumed that if someone is pursuing happiness, um, that other people, people will rejoice with them that other people will celebrate with their choices whether they agree with them or not. And what's happening is there kind of comes this conclusion that if someone does not rejoice with someone who's pursuing happiness, if someone pursuing happiness in a way that they disagree with, they can see it's self-destructive, and if they choose not to rejoice, they're said to be judging. Uh, Barna Research did a massive, massive study three years ago, once again on millennials, my generation. You've got to love my generation. How um, among millennials, 40% agreed that if you disagree with someone, then you are judging them. It, and essentially, if you want to knock it down, when it is disagreeing with someone who is doing something wrong, the term judgmental is being applied to someone who refuses to be complicit in and rejoice in evil. Just think about that for a moment. Remember back when I was a youth pastor, uh, there were a number of times I'd have conversations with students, and uh, especially if we talk about, say, sexuality and God's design for marriage to be, to be between a man and a woman. And often I'd have teens who would say, oh, that is so judgmental to stay, say that. I said, no, it's not judgmental. It's this is what God says. This is God telling what is right and what is wrong. So when it comes to reading about Jesus saying, do not judge, I want to make sure we're all on the same page here. That, once again, when the kind of judging that Jesus is talking about is making a judgment about one's heart and their standing or lack thereof before God. It is not saying that an action is wrong. It's saying that a person is wrong. We should discern between right and wrong. This is the condemning of someone that Jesus is talking about. So let's get back to the text. Let me reread here the beginning. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Jesus has strong words about this. That for anyone who stands in a place of condemnation over others, and He's referring to Jewish culture. This is quite calm, especially among the Pharisees. I mean, the Pharisees would look out at a crowd and like, okay, you're a good person. Oh, you definitely are not. Um, they would judge who was in and who was out of the kingdom of God. They thought they had the right to do that. And Jesus says, no, if you do that, you're going to stand before a greater judge someday. That God himself is the only one who can truly see the nature of one's heart. God's the only one who really decides uh, who is in, who is out, who has put his trust in Jesus. That God alone has that right to make that call. I mean, you could kind of put it this way, that Jesus is saying that we should only allow God to do what only God can do. Only God can discern the final condition of one's heart. And this isn't the only place we find this. In the book of James 4, 11 to 12, James writes this. Brothers and sisters... Do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment of it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? And just think about for a moment, what does it do to us 
when we stand in judgment over someone else. Really, it's an act of self-righteous superiority. Like, I think back to Mullet Man back at Glendalough. You know, I was doing exactly what Jesus says not to do. And I, I didn't know the guy, but I was kind of saying, I am so more righteous than you because I don't write those things in my van. And I actually shave my head. I cut my hair. I don't look like a, you know, a relic from the 80s. Uh, to me, to do that, it was arrogant. It was self-righteous. Uh, Dallas Willard says this, Condemnation always involves some degree of self-righteousness in distancing ourselves from the one that we are condemning. John Wesley put it this way, that is thinking about someone in a way that is contrary to love. That when we stand in judgment of someone else, it's the exact opposite of what Jesus told us to do by loving them. Now he's not done. He, he continues on here. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, something about this passage. Jesus tells the story. It's kind of a ridiculous image. I mean, you got your brother to speck in his eye, and you want to help, but there's like a, a giant log sticking out of your head. Um, turns out it's a cartoon. It really is quite funny. Um, and I'm sure some people listening to Jesus chuckled a bit as he gave this. Often people read us and say, yeah, you, you shouldn't ever try to take the speck out of someone's eye because of that plank. But that's not the point. Jesus actually is, this, it ends with someone being able to help the brother. That we're supposed to be do that. Do that. Galatians 6.1 talks about gently restoring a brother. God called us to support each other, to love each other, to challenge each other, to help each other. What Jesus is addressing, though, is that when someone tries to challenge their brother, tries to point out their sin, when they don't deal with their self first. When uh, they care about, yeah, they want to make sure their brother is right, but fixing their self, no, no, they're really not that interested. And Jesus goes far to call them a hypocrite, saying, you're, you're just an actor. How can you say you really care about that sin when you're not willing to address it in your own life? He says, if you really want to help someone, that's what we're called to do. I mean, we're supposed to discern between good and evil. If you want to help someone be closer to God first, Make sure that you're right with God. Restoring others begins with self-checkup. Now you see God above all else, see his work in his life. Remember that you are sinful and you are in this journey. And once you are at a place of walking with Jesus and seeking after him, he fills you with his supernatural love. And when you are filled with his love, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, then you are able to love your brother and to help them on their own journey. I mentioned earlier that I know for many Christians, and myself included, uh, we're not the best at, at following this. And I know for me in the last week, as I've been working on this, God's been really hitting me because I often fall into condemnation. And there's a story I came across that really challenged me. This was in a leadership journal a few years ago. Uh, you might remember uh, Ted Haggard. Uh, Ted Haggard, he was um, pastor of a, a mega church in Colorado. Uh, he was the head of the National Association of Evangelicals, 2003 to 2006. He was a key advisor to President Bush. Uh, really, during that time, he was the face of the evangelical church. In 2006, he had a, a major fall. Uh, it came out that uh, he had been having an affair, that also he had been paying for male prostitutes. Uh, this man who had this image of being this great Christian leader suddenly uh, didn't look like that great Christian leader anymore. He fell and he crashed hard. And often the media would proclaim him as, you know, this is a proof that Christians are hypocrites. This is a proof that Christians, yeah, they may preach a nice message, but they really don't live it out. And, you know, the rest of the church was very quick to disavow Ted Haggard. You know, we don't want to be associated with him. Well, one of those people who didn't want to be associated with Ted Haggard was a, another pastor in Colorado named uh, Mike uh, Cheshire. And, uh, you know, as Michael watched the fall of Ted Haggard, you know, it was just like, oh, there goes another one. You know, it was kind of a little bit of disinterest. 
Uh, he writes the story that about two or three years after that, uh, he was having lunch with a friend of his who was an atheist. And they're at some restaurant where there were TVs up on the wall and some news network. And on the TV, somehow this story came up just kind of looking back to the fall of, of Ted Hager. And his atheist friend made this comment. He said, that's the reason I will not become a Christian. You know, many of the things that you say, Mike, make sense, but that is what keeps me away. Well, Mike responded, referring to the Hager's fall, saying, hey, man, not all of us do things like that. And his friend said this, Michael, you just proved my point. See, that guy said sorry a long time ago. Even his wife and kids stayed and forgave him. But all you Christians still seem to hate him. You guys can't forgive him and let him back into your good graces. Every time you talk to me about God, you explain that he will take me as I am. You say he forgives all my failures and will restore my hope. And as long as I stay outside the church, you say that God wants to forgive me. But that guy failed while he was one of you. And most of you are still vicious to him. You Christians eat your own. You always have and you always will. There's a, a scary line. Well, Michael went home really bothered by that and realized, I mean, Ted Hager only lived about an hour away from him. Uh, he said, you know, I, he called up Ted and said, hey, can we do lunch? Because he just wanted to have a chance to connect and see what kind of person Ted Hager really was. Expectation was that they get together and reinforce, you know, every opinion he already had about Ted Hager. The fact that he'll be defensive, um, you know, he'll be in denial. They got together and he was quite surprised. Uh, he found a man who had been very broken before God. Someone who was very open about his failings. Someone who had been uh, walking a road of repentance and restoration. Uh, a man who loved Jesus. In fact, uh, Ted Hager actually had just uh, planted a church and God was using it. People were coming to know Jesus. Uh, Michael met Ted Hager's wife. And he was surprised. He found this woman. He said, one of the most godly women that he had ever met. That Jesus was shining through this woman. And he walked away just thinking like, wow, I was so quick to condemn this man when God wasn't done with him yet. He uh, came back and he shared the story with other pastor friends and other people in the church. And I mean, people said, why are you wasting your time with Ted Haggard? There's no way that God could use someone like that again. And then in the article, Michael made this comment, you know, many feel that he couldn't be used by God again, but that's not our call to make. That's God called, God's call to make. And when I reflect back on that, it, it gets me, because I can remember when Ted Hager messed up. I can remember feeling like, oh no. You know, and not just uh, upset with him, but the fact that you know, as the leader of the Evangelical Association, that we're all tainted by that. You know, I, I wanted him to disappear, never be seen again. I was quick to condemn him. You know, I think in the last week, we had the story of Jerry Falwell Jr., and so you've been watching that, his fall as a leader of liberty. And it's so easy to condemn, but it's not our, our, our call to condemn. Uh, we can say those actions are right and wrong, but God's the one. See the condition of the heart. Even the last couple weeks, as uh, Amy and I have been watching political speeches, Amy's been calling me out on this because it's so easy for someone that I disagree with to condemn them. And for Amy to say, hey, Michael, remember that message you're working on? You can disagree with them, but only God sees the condition of their heart. So as we close, I want to give you a couple things here to walk away with. Some things that can maybe help us live this out a bit. Number one, remember where you came from. Remember that every one of us in this room has fallen short of the glory of God. We've rebelled against him. Every one of us is sinful. It's said that one of the things that sets Christians apart is that we've been forgiven. But even in the midst of that, we're sinful, that we have no right to accuse someone else, to judge someone else, to be in a place of superiority. Here's the second one. Internalize what God did for you. I love Romans 8.1. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That if you're here this morning, and if you put your trust in Jesus, even though you've messed up, 
God looks at you, and there's no condemnation that he sees you as his beloved child. And if God doesn't condemn us, then we should be careful not to do that either. Here's a third one, and this is a hard one. Assume the best of people. Uh, several years ago, I was in the church, and there was a major conflict that uh, erupted uh, among the elders. And our district superintendent came in and kind of walked the church through a reconciliation process. And one thing the DS told us as, as a rule is, until someone proves you wrong, assume the best of them. Because what happens is, you know, I'm going to pick on Rick because he's in the front here. You know, if Rick and I are in a conflict, and if we disagree, it's very easy for me to prescribe motives. Rick did that. That's because Rick is out to get me. Rick is an evil person. He is bad. And here's the thing. Reconciliation cannot happen as long as Rick is an evil, bad person. Because I cannot reconcile with someone like that. But if I take the position of saying, you know, Rick, I disagree with you, and you did some things that were wrong, but I'm going to assume the best of you, then reconciliation is possible. Now, if Rick proves to be an evil person, then yes, we could do that. But assume the best until that is evident. And I'll tell you, that's something I'm not good at. God has taken me on a journey there. Lastly, prioritize your walk with God. Remember, how do you take the speck out of someone else's eye? Well, when the plank is removed from your eye first. When your walk with God is central. God will use you in incredible ways. God will use you to help your brothers. God will help you, use you to bring other people closer to God. But it has to start with your walk with God. And when the church lives this out, there really is something incredible that happens. You know, when you look at the vision that the Bible gives us for the church, it kind of works a little bit like a support group. It's a bunch of messed up people who are on the journey to follow Jesus, on the journey to be transformed to be like him. Remember, Jesus told the Pharisees that he didn't come for the well, he came for the sick. And when we have this attitude of we are focusing on loving God and focusing on loving people, and yes, the discerning between right and wrong, when something is wrong, still declaring that. But loving people in the midst of that and letting God be the one who condemns or accepts. When we do that, it's a beautiful thing. And right now, I'm looking at our culture, and we've got an election coming up, and we are so polarized right now, and there are words going back and forth, and there are labels going back and forth. What would it be like if the people of God acted differently? What if we were the people that when it comes to condemning others and assuming the position of judge only God can do, what if we were the ones who chose not to do that? but chose to love instead, and in every moment, continually point people toward Jesus. Point people toward the one who loves them, the one who longs to be reconciled to them, the one who can only do true healing. What would that be said of us as a church? Let's close. Father, I want to thank you for this morning. And I know for me, uh, this is one of those messages and passages exposed to some of the dark places of my heart some of the areas that I need to continually repent of and seek your transformation. Father, may we be a people who don't fit into the mold of condemning that our culture is in. Father, may we show the way of Jesus, a way that is different. Father, throughout the week, as we encounter people and as that that gut reaction to condemn, Lord, may we hold that thought captive. May we remember where we came from. May we remember what you did for us. And Lord, in each of those moments when we are ready to condemn, may that be replaced with a sense of love and mercy and embracing. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you this week.